Hello there, my name is Kevin Mullen and today we're going to be t discussing a sound approach, John Cage and music education uh, and this is Stuart Chapman Hill's review, analysis and discussion of the work and philosophy, philosophy of John Cage and how we can utilize that as music educators. And this will be my uh, summary response and reflection to that. So now the first thing you might ask yourself is who was John Cage? He was uh, an American composer born in the early 20th century who was revolutionary, a uh, true innovator. They, um, uh, a big part of what Cage was all about was the idea that all sound is musically valid, all sound has musical properties, and all sound can be appreciated just as sound without it needing to have uh, a necessary meaning or harmonic context or or even being a sound created from an instrument. I think the best way to give you a good idea of who John Cage was and what he was about would be to run down some of his most well-known compositions to give you the, um, the elevator pitch of them, so to speak. Uh, prepared piano. Cage um, pioneered the technique of what we call preparing instruments, which is where you make some sort of physical alteration to the instrument, um, usually something simple and non permanent to alter the sound. So for example, here I have what you might call a prepared guitar using uh, a rubber band and a pencil. And instead of sounding the way you could, would expect a guitar to typically sound, it sounds like this. Uh, found sounds, which is again recording sounds um, sounds that you can create with objects or sounds found out in the world, the sounds of nature, wind, the sounds of the city, cars, all that sort of thing, and creating a soundscape from recorded sounds. And of course, you can manipulate these sounds too electronically, speed them up, slow them down, distort them, whatever else it might be to create a, a soundscape. His most infamous piece, 4 minutes 33, this is often described as 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence. It is not, and I'm going to prove it to you. We're going to perform an extract of 4 minutes 33. Here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4. Now what did you hear there now? It wasn't silence. I know you heard you heard me drinking my coffee through the microphone. You probably heard the sounds of um, coming through other people's microphones. Maybe their dog back barking in the background or something like that. You heard sounds in your own room, maybe of um, birds outside or cars driving past. Uh, and this piece kind of you know shone a, a spotlight on these non-musical sounds and how well. This is music. He also pioneered uh, what we call indeterminate music, which is used interchangeably with the terms aleatoric or chance music. In a nutshell, this is music that is uh, somewhat random in how the sound is produced or how the music is written. Um, it's very hard to describe this in, in detail. It's a very uh, you could write books about it, books have been written about it, but I think I'll kill two birds with one stone by showing you some indeterminate music in practice in a, not a classroom setting, but something similar to a classroom setting. This is uh, a composer from Belfast, I believe, called Brian Irvine, uh, working with musicians. Uh, he's just met, there's no score. Watch this. <laughs> Exactly. Keep making that size! <laughs>
I would love to show you the whole thing, but we don't have time as slow as possible. Because this piece is being performed right now in a chapel in Germany somewhere by an organ that has a key weighed down by a weight. And this piece is scheduled to finish sometime in the year 2640. I would say, I think it's fair to say that he's a genius, a rule breaker, and a madman. Now, Hill's two cents on, on the matter. Hill elaborated on, in this article on Cage's idea that uh, sound, that we should think of ourselves not as teachers of music, but teachers of sound. That we should have an open-mindedness and accept all genres and sounds as valid, not just um, music that is conventionally attractive. Is a quote from Cage, let sounds be themselves rather than vehicles for man-made theories or expressions of human sentiment. Uh, Hill uh, discussed uh, electronic music and how that can be really useful in the classroom. Again, it doesn't demand uh, the ability to play an instrument and great works can and have been composed without the use of an instrument. Electronic music, uh, manipulating sound through software, uh, sine waves, you can make great music with sine waves, you can create ridiculous chords with ridiculous rhythms of binaural beats, you know, found sound, as we said, logic, again, you can, if you listen to anything in the top 40, it's probably been made with logic, and muse score, again, great for composers, and of course, there's limitations of notation, using traditional notation and traditional ideas of music, we're limited by what we can play, we're limited by what we can, we can physically write and realize on the page, performers are judged on their ability to replicate what's written on the page, not on their ability to express something original and creative. Uh, this is what the great YouTube uh, music educator Adam Neely calls the cult of the written score. Um, we should acknowledge uh, non-instrumental musicians such as electronic and hip-hop musicians as musicians. And here's a, here's a, a quote from, from the article. Perhaps the lesson of 433 is that in the process of teaching music, composition might begin simple attention to sound and its properties, listening for the tack and release, the duration, the volume, the pitch, the timbre, the level, and the overall shape of the sound. How we can apply this in the classroom. The rules of music are learned. How we play, um, you know, how we learn to play something with even tone and time and uh, something properly the way you're taught to play a scale for example and our understanding of how things are written what quaver is and how chords form these are all things that are learned these are not things that are intuitive these are things that we have to put time and effort into understanding as beginning musicians so when we approach this kind of music traditional music as opposed to free or more cajun music there is an initial period where the student has to force themselves to develop a technical proficiency and knowledge, as opposed to creativity and conceptual imagination, which children have in abundance. So this kind of freer music is really a lot more immediately accessible to children because they don't have to develop technique and knowledge, which means they can get instant gratification in no time they can find themselves playing and enjoying playing music and then they they when they get that high when they get that hit that's when they um when they'll realize that it's worth putting the work to learn your skills and and your theory so that you can play Bach a beginner is not interested in being told um if you work hard you will eventually get your reward Graphic scores are schematic. Graphic scores play on our understanding of visual um, visual knowledge, which is quite, at the very least, in within one culture, if not globally, is quite a universal thing. We recognize that a line going up represents an increase in something. We represent, we rep, we understand that red is an aggressive or a fortif color. Blue is a calm color. These are all things that are, are internalized understandings and graphic scores, I think, kind of play to that. So it's something that you can have a rough approximation of what it is you're trying to achieve without anything specifically being have to explain to you. 
Here's an example from one of my own works. Even here you can see check mirrors and blind spots is a bigger shape than what comes before it. So most performers would take that to mean more of something. Whether that's more notes, louder notes, bigger chords, higher volume, higher notes, who's to say? They're all valid interpretations. Um, it's something that can someone can attempt and realize to some degree without much effort preparation. And before I wrap up, I want to invite you to consider something both as the real life musicians that you are and as the uh, as the hypothetical uh, non-musical children that we could be potentially teaching. What would you rather try and play and approach? This score that's on the page that um, asks you to give something of yourself and to think creatively or something more prescriptive and technically demanding that um, that tells you exactly what to do and expects you can play your instrument at a high level, like I can't hear your answers, of course, if you did answer at all, I am pre-recorded, but um, I think I'm willing to, I think I would bet money on what you picked. So, for listening, uh, great quote from John Cage himself here, I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas, I'm frightened of old ones. Terrific quote, I couldn't agree more. Thank you and um, take care.